Good evening. Welcome to this online event, which is part of our Envisioning Europe lecture series. Thank you for joining us tonight. A special thanks to our lecturer this evening, Dr. Tony Hastrup. I'm also particularly thankful to Professor Agnieszka Graf, Associate Professor at the American Studies Center of the University of Warsaw, who agreed to moderate tonight's discussion. Dr. Hastrup is Senior Lecturer in International Politics at the University of Stirling. She was born in Aberdeen, but moved to Nigeria at a very young age and later to California. Dr. Hastrup holds degrees from universities in three different continents, North America, Africa, and Europe. She's a feminist researcher and teacher. Dear participants, a couple of weeks ago, the subject of tonight's online lecture came up during a conversation I had with a colleague of mine. His reaction was one of disbelief. Feminist foreign policy of the European Union? Should we, should we not first have a true foreign policy of the European Union and then perhaps discuss its possible feminist attributes, the colleague exclaimed. On the surface, this reaction can be dismissed as a typical male one. But the criticism of the EU's foreign policy or of the absence thereof has its merits. Although the EU has made significant progress, towards speaking with one voice in the international arena. The main tools the EU has at, at its disposal, disposal on the international chessboard are still of economic nature, sanctions, for example, or providing funds to encourage steps taken toward the right direction. A lot of development is therefore still possible, and it is all the more important that this development happens in an inclusive and equal way. Dr. T Tony Hastrup will show that feminist principles have been included into the EU's internal and external uh, practices. And attention is being paid now to the experiences of women, girls, and other gender minorities at home and abroad. For example, she will argue, gender equality policies aimed at the global south were introduced. Dr. Hastrup will argue that feminist foreign policies should go beyond gender equality and that feminism has an important transformative potential of driving peace and security in the glo global south. So I think that Dr. Hastrup's insight tonight is a very important one, and I look forward to listening to her views tonight. I would like to thank you all, all once more for being with us, and I wish you a very fruitful debate. And now I hand over to Agnieszka for the moderation. Thank you very much. I am honored um, to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Tony Hastrup. And um, uh, my own expertise on this topic is very weak, but I have been witnessing for the last 10 years something um, that could be named anti-feminist foreign policy in the form of the anti-gender movement. And I'll be trying to ask questions about this later. Um, but I do want to invite everyone who's listening to us to ask questions in the chat. So Tony Hustrup is a professor in international politics at the University of Stirling, UK, a feminist researcher and teacher, and her work seeks to understand prevailing global power hierarchies that inform cooperation and conflict within the international system. Her publications have explored the politics of knowledge making in the context of women, peace and security, global south perspectives and feminist foreign policy, as well as the gendered and racialized nature of responses to contemporary crises. She has co-edited the Rutledge Handbook on EU-Africa relations, as well as the Dictionary of the European Union. She has published articles in prestigious academic journals, including European Political Science, Millennium Journal of International Studies, and Critical Security Studies. Professor Hastrup's current research provides feminist analyses on foreign policy of the Global North actors and the Global South, especially around the women, peace, and security agenda. Much of her work is centered on the activities of formal institutions like the African and European unions. She has published extensively in each of these fields. Professor Hastrup is editor-in-chief of the Journal of Common Market Studies. She is a speaker as well as occasional media commentator, and I'm very much looking forward to her lecture. Welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that very warm introduction. And it's my pleasure and privilege uh, to be speaking this evening to the audience. And I look forward to our discussion. 
So um, many of the EU's member states are either flirting or with the idea of a new foreign policy orientation or indeed have already adopted it, and it's a feminist one. Initially defined by Sweden in 2014, feminist foreign policy has now been adopted by Spain, Luxembourg, a version uh, by France, by Germany, and indeed uh, the Netherlands is also considering uh, one. It has also um, been stated as a priority of the Green Party within the European Parliament, who suggest that the EU as a whole should have a feminist foreign policy, with the caveat, of course, that um, foreign policy uh, for, the, for the most part still tends to be within the domain of states. Each of the states that have leaned towards this uh, new understanding of foreign policy have tended to put different emphasis based on their specific priorities. At the same time, they do share certain commonalities. For example, they make significant commitments to the implementation of the global normative frameworks like the Women, Peace and Security Agenda or the Sustainable Development Goals as being central to their foreign policy practice. They also ascribe human rights and gender equality as the basis of foreign policy design and practice. If we focus, um, if we accept then that the focus on these practices is feminist, then we also know that in recent years, the European Union and the European Union's external relations uh, architecture has begun to embrace and internalize feminist principles more overtly within its external relations. Still, of course, there is no single definition of feminist foreign policy, and we might expect differentiations among European actors. This move towards the greater inclusion of feminism has been informed both by internal as well as ex internal drivers as well as external commitments. So internally, of course, civil society is uh, certainly pushing this as a, a, a better way of doing foreign policy. But we also know that communities of practice have developed within European institutions to really galvanize the ways in which the European Union can lead on global initiatives. And we've definitely seen this with respect to the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, as well as meeting some of the goals of uh, sustainable development. So pushing more feminism into external relations has also been deemed an extension of this story that we often tell about the European Union as a gender equal polity, particularly when compared to other um, polities. So feminism in this sense can be understood as trying to draw attention to the need for full economic, political and uh, social equality, primarily for women. But do these um, commitments, prior commitments, as well as some of the newer ambitions signal a feminist foreign policy? I would suggest that despite the significant gains made through this increased attention to feminist principles, the current approach does indeed provide an entry point to more gender equality practices, but it does not necessarily offer the sort of transformative feminist possibilities um, that advocates of uh, feminist foreign policy might want, because in a sense, it does not seek to um, dismantle or upend some of the structural systems of oppression, uh, such as racism, sexism, and ableism that exist within the international system. For me, feminist foreign policy provides the opportunity for thinking differently about some of those things that international actors like the European Union does, um, that is often external to their own borders, but also um, internally as well. It helps us perhaps think differently about how the world is ordered and how we might begin to transform this. It might help us think differently about how we break down the present hegemonic power hierarchies that might foster a feminist peace. Ultimately, a feminist foreign policy might, um, we might say, seeks to sort of encompass all of foreign policy within a feminist ethos. And in today's world, of course, there are different feminisms 
And we might expect then that feminist foreign policy means different things to different people. So a liberal feminism might be satisfied with representation. More women in spaces of foreign policy decision making. Whereas a more critical feminism might demand more. If the feminists in this new uh, foreign policy design and practices should, however, signal change, it does raise a few questions for me. Can feminism be emancipatory and liberatory for the most marginalized? That is in terms, of course, of material resources, but also in terms of the ability of everyone to live full and creative lives. Such feminism, of course, cannot be underpinned by racist systems and thus must seek actively to dismantle them. It must, of course, attend to gender equality, but not only that. So feminism, eh, in this sense, must be more than gender equality. It cannot simply accord gender equality eh, to those spaces where those eh, in power continue to benefit. It must actively seek to challenge heteropatriarchy that largely, to my mind, underpins the international system. But one of the other questions I tend to ask myself about, you know, what are the possibilities of feminist foreign policy is, are the approaches to external relations consistent with what is happening internally? And I think this question is especially important in the context of the European Union. At the same time, can we leverage the language of feminist foreign policy externally and not come, for example, consider not just general uh, domestic policies, but how those policies impact certain minoritized communities within the union? As it is then, there is still a long way to go with respect to the extent to which feminist foreign policy is achievable in um, the European context. Primarily because I argue the EU functions and exists within an international global order that is not, um, uh, is not committed to sort of dismantling itself and those hierarchies that underpin it. As such, a lot of the propositions for feminist foreign policy that has been put forward in the European context is not transformative. I make this broad argument about the possibilities nevertheless of transformation, as well as its absences, by drawing on critical feminisms. Specifically, I want to argue drawing in part of some of my work on the EU's engagement with Africa, although I think it might apply more broadly, that there is a clear tension between the ambition of a feminist ethic to understand, criticize, and correct, and the ambitions of foreign policy as they currently exist, that is invested in pragmatism, that suggests that we must embrace geopolitics, and indeed um, is able to um, account for those sort of two strands by, certain, uh, by undertaking certain practices. I think then that the result of what we have, uh, where we see certain calls for feminist foreign policy and indeed parallel calls for more coherent European foreign policy, is that we might begin to see uh, certain co-optations of feminist narratives that simply reproduce the system as it exists without really seeking to transform it um, of the hierarchies that feminists have tended to call attention to. So I want to now reflect on feminist foreign policy um, as it currently applies, as I said, with respect to the European Union, the European Union's actions um, in Africa. But as I said, I, I really think that this um, opportunities for the EU's engagement in Africa apply beyond that uh, geographical region. But I think it's a useful illustrative example. I think nevertheless, um, perhaps as a way to signal a, a my, my conclusion towards optimism, that we are in a moment where we certainly see an increase in feminist informed practices, and that this might yield and, and, and does already yield benefits uh, to people, uh, and at the very least suggest that um, another world is possible. <laughs>
So what is family's foreign policy and what does it do? What does it have to do with um, EU external relations? I think when we sort of look at states, um, including and especially EU member states, this feminist foreign policy underscores the importance of women's rights and the idea of gender equality. And this has, off, this has been the case for several decades. So we definitely see a momentum that calls for increasing women's participation and representation in policy domains that have traditionally been seen as gender neutral, um, uh, but also gender blind, so security, trade, defense, and indeed diplomacy. This shift in foreign policy discourse, I think is part of a broader move uh, that we see uh, both at society and at elite levels and the same sort of discourses that have engendered um, and has created the space for um, what some have called a backlash. In recent years and within EU institutions, the idea of gender equality as the foundational norm of the integration project is more or less normalized. In the area of development policy, we accept this. The fact that the EU has committed to global initiatives such as the SDGs and especially Goal 5, Gender Equality, and Goal 16, Peace, Justice, and Strong Institutions, as well as the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda, underscores this point. These global commitments have led to significant milestones in the EU's external relations. In 2018, the strategic approach to women, peace, and security um, has, has created a framework to support the EU um, efforts, including institutions, as well as member states to implement the Women, Peace and Security Agenda domestically and in foreign policies. More recently, the Gender Action Plan, otherwise known as GAP3, um, has also uh, been an indication of a progressive approach to commit the EU to supporting women's and girls' leadership and participation in formal institutions where they are typically excluded. Effectively then, what we see is that EU institutions in Brussels, as well as member states' policies, are paying attention um, to the ways in which women and girls are often discriminated. In some cases, some have even gone as far as to pay attention to certain different axes of oppression with respect to gender, race, sexuality, disability, national origin, or ethnicity. And I think, um, to my mind, these are very uh, important signals uh, suggesting that the EU does pay attention to issues around gender and certainly feminist principles. And of course, there have been concrete implications to paying attention to some of these issues, one of which I highlight is the Spotlight Initiative, which is a collaboration between the EU and the UN. Uh, and the goal is to eliminate all forms of violence against women and girls, including femicides, domestic and family violence, sexual and ex uh, economic exploitation, as well as female genital mutilation. It is indeed a one of a kind investment with a focus on the global South. So it targets countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean and the Pacific. This involves not only supporting individual countries as, and um, civil society organizations, but also regional organizations like the African Union. In general, then we can sort of say, this is good. This is unsurprising to a certain extent, particularly if we accept that those stories that the European Union tells of itself. Um, and I think for supporters of feminist foreign policy, this sort of this is a sort of trajectory that we we would want. But is this new claiming of feminism in foreign policy about changing the typical trajectory of foreign policy, or simply having a bunch of programs? With colleagues, I've previously shown that claims of feminism in foreign policy can indeed provide strategic advantage uh, and, and, and is used as a legitimizing move for uh, foreign policy actors. And indeed, I would suggest that the EU is no different in this respect. At the same time, the adoption of the feminist label without the consideration of power relations at the heart of the international system, 
and particularly without seeking to reflect on the legacies of colonialism uh, and, and its persistence in um, ongoing interactions cannot yield the sort of transformation that is required for a feminist practices and feminist activism to thrive um, and be sustainable. And so when we sort of zoom out beyond the positive story of looking at the specific areas of gender equality policies in external relations, we find that another story emerges when we begin to apply a feminist lens to the EU's external relations or foreign policy. There is therefore that tension that exists beyond, between that ambition uh, to a feminist ethic and the broader interests of um, the European Union as they currently exist. If we do not seek then to um, overhaul the current patterns of uh, interaction within um, uh, the system as it currently exists, are we simply just adding feminist um, in front of foreign policy or are we seeking to do something different? And it's perhaps useful now to sort of take a bit of a step uh, back as it were uh, to think through how feminist foreign policy has been conceived. There is no singular definition of feminist foreign policy and yet each actor that commits to this tries to articulate it in some way. And so the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, which I work quite closely with, believes that foreign policy has the potential to be the mechanism of transformation, of transforming the international system, focusing on equality, justice, solidarity, and peace. So if we want to transform um, the foreign policy as it currently exists, then this is where we need feminism. Feminist foreign policy has the potential to create a framework of foreign policy that focuses on the well-being of marginalized people and invokes processes of self-reflection regarding foreign policy's hierarchical global systems. It provides a space to rethink policy from the viewpoint of the most vulnerable, both in our domestic context, but in terms of those who are then recipients of said foreign policy practice. In short then, feminist foreign policy should consistently interrogate the violence of global systems of power. And I think this is a very different approach to foreign policy in the sense that it doesn't see it as a um, one-time occurrence or a policy that is just in a document, but it's an iterative process. This understanding of a feminist foreign policy um, accords well with what um, Karen Agastam and uh, Annika bergman Rosmond argue for when they think about feminist foreign policy, that it should be an ethical um, type of a policy approach. And perhaps in those ethics, it might provide a strategic advantage. But often what we found is that even among those states that invoke a feminist foreign policy, this is often seen as an opportunity to sort of um, situate and replace ourselves as a being better um, within the international system. And in that sense, then adopt certain masculinities of the manly state. Indeed, what we see with respect to the European Union specifically is that feminism is deployed in certain instances, but it's often siloed away from the whole gamut of the different practices of foreign policy. And so we might sort of see feminism more obviously with respect to development policy, but trade, migration, security, and defense more or less remain the same. So one area of contestation uh, which has come up a, a lot recently has been around um, issues of military and military forms of security. Whereas feminists, of, of different types have um, argued that the normalization of militarism has shown time and time again as making the possibilities of true gender equality less likely. Yet it still seems to be the preferred form of um, security or security actiness, even when we know that militarism as an ideology is hierarchical 
often reifies masculinities that reinforce rigid divisions of gender roles. Another area we can think of is in the area of migration. In this arena, women in a current uh, foreign policy practices are often framed as victims or mothers rather than agents themselves. And so therefore, when we intervene in this area of policy, we often again adopt those um, very masculinized uh, practices uh, and these masculinized interventions in the name of security we see has led to brutalities in places like Libyan slave markets, racism and xenophobia in other countries. Beyond these, those who champion EU feminism, I think um, when they do so without caution, fail to consider the persistence of these hierarchies that exist within the international system. And in as much as we don't interrogate those systems, um, I think we are doomed to sort of repeat the same of the same. And I want to use the example of the EU's engagement with Africa as a, my example. This is unsurprising. This is the area of work that I have focused on for the last two decades. And it is one in which uh, there is a well-accepted story of that has been rehearsed over and over. But I think it is worth uh, reflecting on that story and, and that knowledge uh, through this feminist lens. We know that the relationship between the EU and African countries is not one of equals. And we can measure this in a variety of ways. By and large, I have concluded that the, the, the nature of this relationship it has changed over time to a certain extent, but it is still one that tends to um, engender and, and reify a structure of power and a structure of the relationship that is still very much steeped in colonial patterns of interaction, despite efforts, I think, on both sides to try to move away from those um, areas. This is partly due to certain materialities. Um, there is more wealth on one side than the other. Um, it is also uh, the case that uh, materially one side has more power in the context of the international system than the other. And these kinds of practices, of course, are engendered not just by formal government institutions, but all types of actors from individuals, um, the structure of tourism from NGOs to businesses. This is a reality. And it is in this context that the EU has constructed its foreign policy practices um, with African partners. It is also in this context that the EU has tried to change its relationship over the last 60 or so years with African partners. But two issues emerge. First is that the hierarchical relationship that frames this relation, that, that, that currently frames Africa-EU relations is of course antithetical to the promise of feminist foreign policy. And we know that despite commitments such as the spotlight initiatives that has been made to this region, this has not dislodged the nature of that relationship, which means that we come back to the same frustrations over and over again. This year, prior to the sixth summit between the European Union and the African Union, the two sides articulated that they wanted a common goal, that they wanted to press a reset button on the relationship, given that over the last few years, this relationship has been dominated uh, as much by history, but also by mistrust and mismatch of expectations, and indeed lots of anxiety, as the EU tries to counter the role of new actors like Russia and China on the continent, while also responding to the frustration of African decision makers. The second issue, of course, is that Africa-EU relations does not exist outside of the setup of global politics in of itself. So this relationship is one that functions within a sort of traditionally, I would say, masculinized environment. In this environment, the EU vis-a-vis -vis others is often feminized. So it is almost a sense that the EU must prove this sort of masculinized role vis-a-vis -vis, um, a, a quote-unquote lesser actor within the international system. And consequently, it becomes very easy then to sort of silo those feminist principles to just the areas that are regarding gender equality policies rather than trying to transform the system 
within which indeed gender equality can exist and thrive for everyone. So while the invocation of feminism might serve the purpose of using gender to pursue European interests abroad, without reflecting on the patterns of exclusions that a feminism uh, that isn't grounded in um, you know, the political project of emancipation and liberation, what we might find is that feminism is just used as an empty signifier meaningless uh, for the purposes of a uh, just uh, European uh, Union foreign policy. So this all seems very pessimistic, but is there um, a way forward? I think uh, still that there are important linkages between feminism and foreign policy, because it does force us to sort of think about what the other po possibilities are that are out there. It helps us question the gendered and racialized nature of global state structures, policies, and politics. In a sense, feminism demands justice. Yet, the possibility of a transformative feminist foreign policy can only happen when it does not reproduce sort of this uh, masculinities, which are often Eurocentric, and indeed underpinned by the practices of the European Union, inclusive of its institutions, as well as member states. And of course, we know that the EU does do better than a lot of other actors in the international system and continues to strive to do better. But it is precisely because it is capable of more that I think that this sort of critique is useful. To do better, however, does not call for a singular policy, but for a more consistent one, even when the stakes are high and even when it's difficult because feminist work is difficult. I therefore propose the approach um, that has been used by authors Jessica Chong, Dilek Gerso, as well as Mary Kirchner and Victoria Shire in their work, Feminist Foreign Policy in the Everyday. The authors advocate for feminisms informed by and built on legacies of transnational activism, critical theory and everyday practices and solidarity based on five core values, intersectionality, empathetic reflexivity, substantive representation and participation, accountability, and active peace commitment applied to a range of foreign policy decision making. So intersectionality in foreign policy for them is an essential component to disrupt the traditional modes and expressions of power that I've identified. This requires, of course, that uh, foreign policy actors in Europe really acknowledge and identify um, the, the, the sort of harm that um, power dynamics as they currently exist have um, perpetrated and how they can reorient those power dynamics so that it favors those who are most marginalized. In the Africa-EU context, this means giving space, of course, to African actors, civil society, local communities, um, while also ensuring that elite interaction um, elite interactions prioritize some in these communities. Um, as I like to say, this requires a lot of humility on all our parts. The second core value of empathetic reflexivity demands that those who are in positions of power in the context of any relationship consider the impact of their actions and historical position in relation to others and be attentive and responsive to the needs of those around them. Such an approach, of course, challenges the ways in which we currently understand foreign policy, where the priority tends to be the state um, that has the policy rather than others who would be recipients of that policy. With respect to substantive representation, I think this has an internal as well as external dimension. It requires us, for example, to think about who is included within our foreign policy apparatus. Do we include all types of people do we prioritize diversity across all of the policy fields of external relations, as well as prominent leadership positions? I think this has been consistently difficult for the European Union, not simply in relation to um, Africa, but more broadly. And so this sort of um, engagement with this uh, core value um, asks 
that we do pay attention to our institutions as they exist because uh, this, these people, this sort of representation become representative of the EU externally. And then you've got accountability. And the EU often conceives of accountability with respect to the requirements of auditors. But here, Chong et al. say that um, accountability should really be about institutions being accountable to the policy beneficiaries. And again, this reframes the ways in which we think foreign policy is and how we should operate. And I think, you know, in, the, in using the example of um, Africa, the decades long battle of the EU to implement the economic partnership agreements and the resistance to it really demonstrates the ways in which good relations have not been fomented because of the EU's insistence and the continued resistance to this. And in that sense, then the EU is seen as being non-accountable to the trade unions as well as community organizations on, on the African continent. And finally, active peace. This is especially close to my heart and I think um, very important uh, given our current context. For the EU, which has lived off the moniker of being a peace project, and indeed it was always the unique selling point, I think it's especially important uh, to sort of seek ways of ensuring active peace um, as, a, as a core commitment or foreign policy. At the same time, I think when we're sort of thinking about the possibilities of uh, feminist foreign policy, there is a tension here between this idea of a peace project and the creeping militarism and increased militarization for some obvious reasons. In 2003, with the European Security Strategy, there was a sense that the EU, um, perhaps not as clearly, but it did over the years, had adopted this idea of human security. This, of course, did not satisfy a lot of um, a lot of scholars, um, uh, a lot of uh, political uh, policy practitioners, and indeed uh, a lot of other uh, decision makers. And I think this has contributed to this trend towards accepting that security can only be fomented in militarization. And I think this has been underscored even more recently by events in Ukraine, uh, uh, and indeed what continues to unfold. And here, what I'm um, trying to draw attention to, and I think um, what um, the um, other feminists have tried to draw attention to, is the idea um, not that um, we should not have a military weapons, but rather that we should not necessarily just think in binary terms. The EU is a security actor when it does things that are related to the military or it's not a security actor. Because indeed, the, those who've experienced the EU's uh, move towards militarization have not experienced it equally. And that is certainly the case in Africa. And I think this failure to acknowledge the implications of EU foreign policy practice for the other can be dangerous, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis the other values that I've emphasized. I think then, you know, feminist foreign policy, or at least the attempt to achieve feminist foreign policy, allows us to uh, rethink bigger and think about more sustainable ideas of security where a different world is indeed possible. The argument I'm not making is uh, the argument I'm making um, is not one of a of a pacifist, and I think that's really important to underscore. But a feminist, that when we might think about um, the potential benefits of the immediate utilities of militarization, that we are also obliged to think of its aftermath, to imagine alternatives that promote social justice and well-being as valuable outcomes. And as such, investment should also go towards facilitating reconciliation, empathetic dialogues, equality, equity, justice, and diplomacy as other alternatives towards conflict resolution. And that indeed, the ways in which we organize our militaries will also consider this. So let me conclude. It is true that progressive stakeholders have been successful in championing feminist informed policy practices. Some of this um, advocacy has culminated in significant frameworks guiding, for example, security and development policies, perhaps to a certain extent, um, external, other external relations policies.
These new initiatives have helped us prioritize gender equality policies and external relations um, and reinforce the EU's image as a leading gender and feminist actor. I myself have been very pleased with a, some of these developments. Yet to think that by reflecting on the broader domain of external relations, the aspiration of a feminist foreign policy, as I've outlined um, here, is not we're, we're not quite there yet, I should say. I think where we are at, feminism is de being deployed narrowly. And I think often one of the culprits is the lack of coherence between what is promoted externally, but also then what is demanded internally. And although I haven't really paid attention to this, I think it is also worth reflecting on the fact that, you know, not all EU member states are on the same page with respect to actually actively promoting feminism within the European Union borders. This alone undermines the grand narrative of the EU as a promoter of a gender equality. Importantly, the extent to which external relations as currently conceived can achieve social justice, to my mind, is uncertain despite this recent attention to feminist principles. Yet, I am often hopeful. When we think about strategies like the gender equality strategy of 2020, I think there are sort of spaces and entry points for the EU to rethink its external relations, to rethink its foreign policies. We've seen um, leaps and bounds that have now considered feminist principles like in intersectionality, which if operationalized effectively, can begin to address some of the gaps that exist. Yet, in as much as there isn't um, a full buy-in and there's an unwillingness, again, to undermine the systems that underpin um, oppressive power structures. At this point, then, a feminist foreign policy for the EU can only be aspirational. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there would be a round of applause now if we were not online. Um, thank you for a very insightful lecture and a sobering one. Um, it sounds like uh, the question uh, in the title of your talk is answered um, with a great do uh, dose of skepticism. You seem to be saying that, well, we're not there yet, but we're moving slowly. Um, and I certainly applaud your um, insight about not all member states being on the same page as I am from a member state that has made anti-feminism. Um, its uh, stake in the European Union. So the scene is quite complex. And um, uh, I do have some questions for you from the audience uh, that I think are actually more interesting than the ones I was going to ask. So I'll leave mine for later. Um, if you could choose one urgent feminist policy action that the EU could take, what would it be? This, this question comes from Semina um, Badica. Well, um, I, th I tend to think a lot of things are urgent. Um, and I, I think that um, whatever I, answer I give, it, would, it doesn't suggest that it's the most urgent thing. But I certainly think that the um, migration regime practices um, would be something that I personally would want a more feminist reflexivity around just because of the ways in which um, practices of individual member states, but also um, the EU, the sort of broader EU approach, tend to sort of re-victimize and re-marginalize and is inconsistent with the sort of ethos of um, this regional project that um, I, I thought I was familiar with. But, but I think, again, it's really important to underscore that there's a range of areas um, Sexual violence, sexual gender-based violence is also an area that is close to my heart. Um, and I mean that in the sort of domestic context of EU member states, but also in terms of its external relations. How do we protect women who are confronted with sexual violence, who are fleeing conflict, for example, um, when we have migration regimes that don't necessarily differentiate, um, for example? So in a sense, a lot of these issues are interlinked. Um, and it would be very difficult for me to say there's one thing. Uh, in fact, there are quite a number rattling in my head now, but those would be sort of two examples. 
muted. Um, which takes me to the question I was going to ask you um, on Ukraine, but not only in terms of um, uh, foreign policy, but also in uh, terms of the EU's response to the um, refugee crisis. Do you think uh, feminist principles are being employed, taken into account? Because we are dealing with a, with a huge number of women who are fleeing violence. Much of it is sexual violence. Um, do you think the, the EU is living up to the standards set by feminist um, foreign policy or feminism in general? Right. I mean, I think, again, another complex question. Um, I think, you know, I perhaps have the luxury of being an academic and not a policymaker. And if that were the case, I would say absolutely not. Of course, the EU is not living up to um, its expectations. There are, um, I'm not sure that all of the, you know, the women who are fleeing this violence are um, being supported. That is also partly due to the architecture of this thing we call the European Union. In the end, member states have to take responsibility and different member states have different capabilities. They think of these issues in different ways. But perhaps in a sort of more broader EU critique in the sense that, of course, almost any blog piece or article that you pick up, um, and you and I have also discussed this, we acknowledge that these are issues. But to what extent has it been on the forefront of the sorts of dialogue and meetings that um, different leaders keep having, right? So, you know, to what extent are we sort of saying, we want to cease fire, we do not want the continuation of this um, imperial war, if we're going to um, even have anything close to a mediation, mediated settlement, um, leaders are talking. But what I want to know, and I certainly don't see it from the sort of big headlines, is that sexual violence is not being put on the forefront. Gender-based violence is not being put on the forefront of any of these negotiations. And it's not because we don't know, which then asks the question, to what extent do we prioritize it as an area? Um, to be fair, if I can be, um, this is not unique necessarily to the EU or EU member states, but this simply underscores and um, underlies the ways in which you know, women's lives uh, and women's experiences continue to be marginalized within practices of international politics. Thank you. Um, there is a question concerning the role of media. Um, where would you place the role of media in promoting um, movement towards feminist foreign policy? Um, and I would like to add to that, do you think the media are in on the topic at all? Yes, but how they're in, I guess, is the thing that I query. Um, in, I'm based in the UK, which is, is currently, it's not a member of the European Union, of course, but nevertheless, I would say still sort of shares uh, a lot of similarities with a lot of EU member states. Um, there is a very um, virulent thread of what some people might call a sort of gender backlash, feminist backlash, or anti-genderism. Um, and as you previously hinted at, the UK is indeed not unique. So if there's anti-genderism, then it must mean that there are discourses around feminism. Now, these discourses around feminism are broad. Um, they are not settled. Uh, there is a lot of contestation around it. Uh, to use the example of the UK as well, we here have uh, a very, um, I would say, corrosive debate around um, rights of transgender people, which very much fits within sort of those feminist debates, um, which has um, implications uh, for the lives of real people in a variety of ways. And uh, the media has a significant role to play in the articulation of these different arguments, whatever perspective you come from. So indeed, I, I do think that the, the media has a role. The traditional media, so the newspapers who've moved online, but also, of course, social media has a significant role uh, to play. Um, this isn't necessarily my area of research, but certainly something that uh, I've experienced um, as, as someone who uh, speaks on some of these issues and, and does research in this area. Yes, thank you. If I, if I can comment, I think the social media especially are a site uh, of a lot of polarization and 
um, a space where the anti-gender arguments actually fly quite high, um, also within the feminist debates. It's mm -hmm. a very disturbing phenomenon yes. um, that has been theorized by sociologists, actually. Well, we have a question uh, along the what shall we do lines. Um, it's a question from Belgium. Uh, what else can we as citizens do beyond votes, writing, representatives, protesting, to have a deeper impact on feminist foreign policy intersectionality and further in other policy areas so advice for citizens who for whom this is a close to heart topic i you know i think that's a really fantastic question and, and one that doesn't have an easy answer and you know and cynthia Enlo, who's a famous uh, feminist international politics scholar uh she once said to me feminist work is hard and um, I guess the way to translate that is that those things that have been stated, i.e. writing letters to your government when you want to challenge uh, some of their policies, basically putting yourself on the front line. Uh, when you go on those protests, you might feel like, well, the law hasn't changed or the practices haven't changed tomorrow. I think that's because feminist work is hard. Uh, and that, it, you know, the sort of change that we want wouldn't um, happen immediately. And that's where, that's why I I hope I ended up on a, a note of, of, of hope, really, that this is a continuous iterative process and it's hard. And, you know, it takes a very long time to change institutions in a broad sense, to change society, to change government institutions. Uh, and, and so it's, it's about sort of just chipping away at those things that just make uh, the space um, unequal and, and in, in a, a, a space that sort of reifies these hierarchies. Um, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not an easy path, but I think everything that has been stated is precisely the right way to keep going about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and thank you for mentioning Cynthia Enloe. Um, I am a fan of her work and I had the great honor and pleasure of interviewing her um, a few years ago when I was putting together the um, gender and the global right uh, issue of signs. And um, she was very worried about the what, what you've been calling, referring to as backlash and its successes. Um, there is a question concerning history from uh, Blandine uh, Smilanski. Do you think the history of feminism and feminist struggles from the past provide us with relevant examples on how to influence foreign policy from the feminist perspective? So, you know, are there successful campaigns in the past that actually influenced uh, EU foreign policy along the feminist lines? Uh, thank you for that great question. So. The way that I think about, say, our feminism today, or you know, this call for feminist foreign policy today, is I very much stand on the shoulders of giants, and I think you know, a lot of feminists would say the same, right? Um, I'm here because of the work that was done in the past that said, you know, women should be allowed into the academy, for example. So that I sort of see it as the, as the continuation. So when we look into the past, we're kind of looking at the present as well, indeed, at the future. We know that feminist peace movements have had significant impacts on um, uh, helping to bring about uh, the ends of conflict, but not just bringing about the end of conflict, helping to sort of um, articulate uh, the framework for what the new society would look like. And we've seen those movements all around the world, uh, in Europe, uh, in Western Europe, in Northern Europe, in Central Eastern Europe, in Latin America, in Africa. Women's movements have been very significant. Um, when we sort of think, for example, about where we are with um, nuclear ban campaigns, that has been because of the significant role that feminists and feminist activists, peace activists have played. Uh, and, and we can continue to sort of draw on um, their inspirations, uh, sometimes even their tactics. But at the same time, we also have a lot of tools at our disposal right now, and we can leverage those. So I sort of see, um, in a way, the past as the present. You know, we continue that work uh, and we, sh we would hope that, you know, uh, 
those who come after us also uh, continue that work. Thank you for that. Um, I got the impression from your talk that you um, theorize a complex relationship between uh, feminism and pacifism or peace movements. On the one hand, there is a um, foundational commitment to peace as a um, as a goal. On the other hand, I did not gather from your lecture and from your writings that you are a pacifist. And um, so obviously feminist peace movements are a contributor and a foundation but but you know if you were if, if we were speaking now to ukrainian feminists they certainly mm -hmm. would not agree with the uh, pacifist statements of italian feminists that have been made in the last few days for instance mm -hmm. where, where do you stand on this what, what do you think are the feminist values in case of an invasion such as putin's invasion of ukraine Right. And is it possible to have one feminist stand in such a situation? Absolutely not. Uh, to answer your last question, I don't think it's possible to have one feminist stand. So, uh, you know, if I was speaking to for myself personally, I, I like the, the, you know, English word nuance. I think that um, one has to take a lot of nuance to this. But I also will be the first to admit that it's easy to be nuanced when you're not facing down a, the barrel of a gun. Uh, Certainly, in my experience uh, of uh, feminist peace activism, um, lots of feminists are not opposed to um, self-defense. And I think that um, we can make, we can see clear patterns of why that would be necessary in the context of uh, this unjust war. At the same time, I will be, I'm one of those people who does, uh, as I did in my lecture, ask that we be very cautious about the idea that increasing militarization is the thing that will save us um, even from this just um, aggression. And I say this um, based on my own personal experiences. And in that sense, I cannot speak for Ukrainian feminists in the same way that indeed I can't speak for the Italian feminists who are also speaking to their own past, present and potentially future um, experiences. I look, for example, at the um, immediate, the, the sort of escalation of militarization towards Gaddafi's Libya and the calls by Libyan feminists at that point uh, to be cautious about the sort of um, the ways in which weapons were given and the ways in which weapons were used in Libya, um, but also it wasn't just the Libyan feminists, but they were especially vocal about this. Now, most people who uh, study this uh, particular country or area, I'm sure you can imagine what they have to say about uh, the situation in the country. But importantly, we also know that the excesses of um, increased militarization in Libya did have implications, for example, for other conflicts um, in, in, on the continent, like the one in Mali uh, and beyond as well. So I guess what I want to highlight is that feminists, uh, not all feminists, because there is no one feminism, a lot of feminists, including pacifist feminists, disavow increased militarization. A lot of feminists like myself ask us to be cautious about this militarization as um, the, you know, the alternative, but rather that, you know, I, I'm not um, naive uh, to the, um, to the reasons at which one has to defend themselves, to the ways in which um, sometimes defending yourself is the only way to end violence in yourself, but rather asking that we be very cautious about the broader implications of this, that we think about the alternatives, what happens when, um, you know, what happens to those weapons when hopefully uh, this conflict is over? What kind of plans are we putting in place, for example? Um, and I don't, I, uh, you know, I would like to think that uh, Ukrainian feminists would also agree with that. Um, uh, so, I, you know, I would suggest that even within feminism that we perhaps uh, not uh, think in terms of uh, just the binaries of, um, you know, no weapons or weapons. Yeah, um, I think one thing that has to happen is a European debate um, that includes feminist voices from various countries. Absolutely. Um, 
and allows these different positionalities. And thank you for what you said about self-defense mm -hmm. and as a necessary response um, to extreme violence. Um, our time is almost up um, and the questions, uh, there, are, there are no further questions. So I will take this opportunity to thank you enormously for this very insightful lecture and for your responses to thank the question. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to reading more of your work. Thank you, thank you. and yours. <laughs>